Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, I'm Leo Casey. Um, I work in National College of Ireland. I'm involved with education programs there and learning and teaching. Um, and Suzanne and I were discussing what we might do in a session like this. There are many different ways of approaching it. I think all, we're all adult educators, so our natural instinct is to have conversations um, and uh, to have as much participation as possible. But we also um, realize that there are going to be constraints about the configuration that we have today and um, how much dialogue we can have in a process like this. So let's see where it goes. But I suppose like all of you, um, I work well when people interrupt, ask questions, maybe stimulate or contradict. So please keep any chat going in the group chat. Suzanne said she'd have a look at it. Um, and um, I hope to uh, speak for a while and then to be able to um, open the conversation to the wider group at a, at a certain point. So what we're going to do is to address five reflective questions for adult educators. Um, and I just want to say a few words about what we mean by reflective questions. Um, I think we're so familiar with the term reflective and reflection that we now take it for granted. Um, and even in college, when we ask our students to write a reflective report, um, we, we describe a process after a student may, may be involved in teaching practice that they, that they um, have a reflective journal. And so you can see that this word has been bandied about, so to speak, in the education world. And really, I, I'm not sure people have been able to stop and think what it, exactly it means to reflect. Um, so let me start by saying what it doesn't mean. Um, reflection is not about doing something and then sometime later thinking back over what you did um, and maybe validating your action or even judging your actions or something like that. Because that form of reflection, which is, I think is the most common conception of reflection, looks back. It looks back at the past. It's, you can see that it's just basically a process of, of recall and sometimes vindication. Yes, often uh, critique, but it's, it's, it's not a very fruitful process in education terms. When we reflect, the direction of reflection should actually be into the future. That's, if you actually go back into the kind of core idea, which was, um, I suppose, put forward first by John Dewey, it's, it's the idea that the, uh, we can harvest the experiences of the past to inform our actions in the future. So the direction of reflection is into the future rather than into the past. And reflection is an ongoing process. It's not something that you do once. It's not the same as deep thinking. And often it involves um, moving the lens of your perspective from one uh, angle or dimension to another. So if you look at the five questions here, I say, what's happening? We're gonna have a discussion about what it means, what's happening at the moment from an education perspective, what it means for our learners. So you can see there is a perspective shift. I'm inviting us to think, okay, what does that look like if we were one of the learners that we deal with? And then is there something new happening in terms of what people need to learn? The need for learning, has something happened there? Is there a new driver in town? Um, and, and, and delivery, look, look what we're doing at the moment. This is a, a webinar, it's, a, it's an online process. This probably um, would be unusual for, for many of us um, uh, and certainly unusual for our learners. And then what does it mean for us as persons and as professionals? So you can see that the, the lens, the perspective lens is shifting around as we ask each of those questions. Um, and that's the reflective process. And so it is not the case that I pose five questions and then I say, well, here's the answers to these five questions. You, you would certainly not believe that and I'm certainly not going to attempt to answer them. It is the question, it is, it is, it is the case that what I'm suggesting is that if we were to keep these five questions 
to the foreground of our consciousness as we proceed with our strategies and with our, our processes and delivery during the next few months or years, that this will be a very useful way to inform our future actions. So that's, that's what we mean by reflective questions. They're open, they're going to be continuous, and I think we need to develop our own capacities to, to move around between these um, individual questions. So Barry, if I could just move to the next slide, it'd be great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so in relation to what's happening, you can read the news, listen to the news, watch television, you really can't get away from what's going on at the moment. I don't know about you guys, but we ration our news to once a day because I just can't cope with the same story again and again. Um, and we hear uh, what's happening from um, a medical perspective, from an economic perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a government perspective, political perspective. Um, all of these are very important, very valid, but I really want to talk about what's happening from a learning perspective. I want to, us to wear our adult educator hats and say, what actually is going on now? Um, and I argue that what's happening could be described in terms of transformative learning. Now, some of you may be aware that there is a, a branch of scholarship in learning theory called transformative learning. The person who put forward most of the ideas and originator of the uh, term transformative learning was um, a man called Jack Misero. And he was informed by a, uh, I suppose the philosophical, social philosophical writings of Jürgen Habermas. But the idea that from time to time, if we could go to the next slide, Barry, uh, um, that from time to time, we change our perspective and change our sense of values. And that there are processes that happen in adult life that cause these changes. Um, now, it can be a gradual process or it can be something dramatic. And Misero describes events that can happen, people being made redundant, bereavements, you know, change of focus, etc., cetera, movement, movements, um, where he had interviewed lots of adult learners and described the journeys that they had in terms of the transformation, not, not of knowledge that they had, or not even of skills, but of the underpinning values that they use to direct their everyday actions. And one characteristic he named that's common in a lot of transformative learning contexts is what he described as the disorienting dilemma. That is where something that you previously relied on is no longer available. Now look at what's happening with us, our schools, our colleges, our community contexts, our workplaces, they're no longer available. We previously relied on them. If that doesn't qualify as a disorienting dilemma, I don't know what would. And then that precipitates a questioning of previously unquestioned values. So we're asking now, What's, what's the value of going in and out of work every day? What's the value of being part of a community in a town as I am in Maynooth, um, or being part of a community in a city, or being part of a rural community? Um, what's the value of time spent with family? What's the value of uh, engagement with friends and colleagues? And so we're asking all of those. And you know what? Once we start asking those questions, um, we're likely almost certainly uh, going to shift the relative weighting of those. So there's a, a, a reframing of underpinning values and that changes our perspectives. And that's a learning process. So that, it's important that as educators, we actually name this. This is transformative learning that's happening to everyone at the same time. It's never, I, in my lifetime, I've never experienced it. In, to this level, I've certainly uh, uh, researched and spoke to people about transformative learning, but we're getting it in, in large doses at the moment. So I think, you know, the, 
the way to think about it might be someone I, I read recently an analogy that it, it, in research terms it's a bit like studying rocks in a landslide you know that 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 so everything is shifting and we're in the lockdown period now so we can only do this this kind of um webinar but maybe uh, we we'll get to a point where we can have limited socially isolated meetings so the combination of the socially isolated meetings and the um uh, webinars that's going to be a new again and then we'll have oh when we go back to full uh, human contact um but we have all this experience of the webinar stuff and things like that and we'll make use of that so just putting it out there that we're going through transformative learning and uh, next slide is asking us to focus particularly on the learners we deal with um, so transformative learning is not just like something that's happening in society it's happening to the people we work with so it's happening to our our learners so what what are the mechanisms involved and what are the implications for them and then subsequently for us so i put forward two words here alienation and identity um, and you, the, the sense i suppose to make sense of this i need to just briefly describe the process of identity building in education terms so not psychology not psychoanalysis but education terms so as an educator i deem the process of developing one's identity as a learning process and when that identity changes radically that's transformative learning as we've just been discussing so the process is that we build our identity by the sense we get of how others see us so our identity is a model of us a model of of each person as others see it as we perceive others see us so it's not as as they actually see but it's as we perceive how others see us uh, here's a great illustration i'm speaking to a big screen at the moment i hope some of you are still there out there i can't see all of you so i have to make allowance for it you know in order to be able to kind of deliver and, and because i naturally would like a lot of human contact and a lot of eye contact and a lot of feedback in order to be able to to work so think of that process over time as as people out there in community you know I, I, such and such is the fixer such such and such a person is the real social person someone else is you know really good with their hands and so you can see that all these attributes that people have come from how they perceive others see them and when when you don't have access to that when you're left out when you're overlooked when you're taken for granted or when you're forgotten the feeling is alienation because you've nothing to build your identity on and you're there and you've no you've no connection with others and what may be happening almost certainly is in this context is that there are a lot of alienated people out there that we can't get at and when we can hopefully that we will have to deal with that alienation and work with them and the process of movement from alienation to the opposite being participation to being active that's actually the learning process in fact that's the community adult learning process that we're all involved in we are bringing people on that journey of participation so of note there the second is that there are pockets of remarkable progress as i mentioned this technology has caused maybe people to try things that they would not previously have done and people are using the technology in social contexts there's a big you know kind of team going on now where every week friends of ours want us to participate in quizzes you know and things so we're trying to find ways of using this technology and that's true for almost everybody there's also as i mentioned the sense in which we press the pause button on our lives in many cases and we find ourselves at home and we find ourselves in our local community and you know what like there's advantages to that and there's progress with respect to that and i could do without being in a packed train 
you know, every morning going from here into NCI and back out in the evening. I'm, I kind of like that part of it. So I see pockets of progress. I'm not naive, of course. It's a horrible thing that, you know, all this has happened. But it's important to identify that there are some good things and some learning that's happening there. But the other point that I have in the slide there is amplification of distance. So we think of distance not just in terms of physical distance, but I mean social distance, not the social distancing that they talk about medically, but I mean people who are just left behind. And I think that's something that we, we would need to note for our learners. If we move to the next slide then. Um, so are there new drivers of learning? So I would argue that the main driver in adult learning is participation. I've, I've, long before this, that would have be an approach that I would have said that like, true, if we want to know why, if, you know, we have a remarkably um, solid concept of lifelong learning that's cradle to grave. That, um, um, notwithstanding what some economists would say, we say cradle to grave, it's the lifelong. But you'd ask yourself, why? Why are we always learning? Why are we learning all the time? What is the driving mechanism? And the driving mechanism is, because of the way humans have developed, we want to participate. We, we are collaborative, that's our nature. We're not isolated, we're collaborative. And, and so almost, if you actually look at all learning that we do, it's to provide us with meaning and collaboration in our lives. Meaning is that sense, you know where we say, um, I want, I wake every day and I have meaning in my life. That's, that's where your identity, you're building your identity through collaboration and through active participation in society. And those who can't do that find themselves driven in many ways to try to rectify that through processes of learning. Um, so there is a new balance now and we need to grasp this. And I think it's a big opportunity. And there's a new balance there in the first two words, community and economy. This, this previous uh, imbalance of economy over community can be rectified now somewhat because in this context, it's community that's keeping us going, not economy. The economy has stopped. So we're, we're living as human beings um, should. And as we gradually open up the economy, we're valuing it in new and different ways, and that's great. The meaning of work, I've always said this, look, the greatest gift you can give to a person who's unemployed is a job. Like, if you can bring people into settings where they can be active and be valued and have meaning in their lives, work is such a place, it's a great thing to do. I, I also, though, caution when um, government, policymakers, economists, see education solely for the purpose of the provision of an, a, a, an adult workforce. Um, that's too narrow a focus for education. Because if you look at the, the reverse, where I have the meaning of work, I also say the work of meaning, which is providing meaning to people so, so that they have a purpose and that they're part of something. That continues throughout life. That's, that's, that's a wider concept than employment. It's, it's a concept of being part and, and countering that alienation I mentioned in the previous slide. So we move to the next uh, slide. I'm deliberately pushing all this through, by the way, so that then we can have question and answer session, you know? So um, if, I, if you need clarification on any of the points, we can go back on it. So how will learning change? Now, by, Often we use the word learning um, uh, in different ways uh, because I would always argue learning is process and it's a human process. So human learning is not going to change. We're adapting. That, you know, that's in our nature is to be adaptable. And so learning itself. But, uh, but what I mean by this uh, reflective question is how will learning contexts and learning delivery change? But, you know, what will happen in with respect to it? So these contexts that learning takes place within community settings, workplaces, colleges and institutions, all of these contexts are in transition. Um, they're being turned on their head. Um, one simple uh, uh, 
change is what was previously called a flipped classroom, which is where um, traditional lecture material, where, which involved maybe introducing conceptual ideas and, and, and the like, would be pre-recorded and then classroom space, which is very precious now, is used only for, for dialogue. Uh, and, and in our own college, I've advocated, if we're bringing in the students, they have to be doing something. We're not bringing them in to take notes. Um, we're not bringing them in to listen. We're bringing them in so they can have conversations with us and with each other, because the identity building in young people in college is absolutely what college is about. It's not about learning, it's about the development of their adolescent identity and that's what they will look for and similarly with people in apprenticeships and similarly for people in in FE and all the settings that we we deal with um so I don't have a I don't have a prediction on it I just know it's all being changed tools and affordances um you know uh, I was thinking because I like like everyone else I'm in the garden now a lot and I'm doing a lot of stuff so um and I I read I don't, if you've came across another learning theorist, Lev Vygotsky, the Russian, um, brilliant, brilliant ideas, but very fertile. Things. But he talks a lot about tools, like he sees language as a tool, conceptual ideas as tools, you know, um, and various other uh, uh, kind of ways of thinking about our skills and how they develop. But he, he, he's, he would argue that like the tool is not, you, you don't teach people the tool. So, um, <clears throat> so when we, pe we say we'll, we'll teach people how to use computers or we'll teach people digital literacy or, e or, or even, you know, various components, what we actually, you I, somebody wouldn't teach me how to use a spade or a trowel or a rake to do gardening. They teach me gardening and I use the tools to do that. And that's often what we're doing with our students is we teach them how to be active and how to participate. And then we have new tools now that we say, oh, look, you know, we can now use online learning. We can now use email. We can use all these things. So I think that the new tools provide us with new capacities, but to do things that we previously want to do. It's, it's about the purpose because I don't need to tell you guys, adults are often um, intimidated and mesmerized by technology. And I, I almost like love the idea with, in dealing with adults in the transition from, you know, kind of being technology, uh, alienated from a technology to, to that is to almost tell them to disrespect the tool, to stop thinking about the tool. What you want to do is to talk to your niece, you know, not, not email or WhatsApp or Zoom. It's talk to your niece and make it about that. And, and so that the tool becomes invisible. So we have a new affordances and things that we can do an extended reach and purpose of our role as adult educators. I think we now can grasp this. Um, we move to the next slide. So finally, what does all this mean for us? Um, well, make note we are ourselves lifelong learners. We are undergoing transformative learning ourselves. And in this process, we are questioning our values and what we're doing. So I think it's worth noting that and it's worth naming it. Um, and um, I, the learning will be different for different people but I see it as, lear as a learning process. That's, in other words, pre-COVID, through COVID on into the future, there's, there's, there's so many new insights, so, so much new ways of looking at things uh, that this is the, you know, where, you know, it's, it's, it, it's like where they say it's raining cats and dogs. I would say it's, it's learning like cats and dogs at the moment, you know, <laughs> because I think we're all figuring out all sorts of new things. So the role of adult educators, I think, could be much more to the fore um, um, in the COVID, post-COVID era. I think we will all be very busy. 
uh, whether we're paid or not or, or valued or not is another thing, but I think we will be busy. I think the business of adult education, I mean, the previous conceptions of adult education, you consider the one very far back, which would be, oh, when you finish school, you are, that's your education, and then you just flatline for the rest of your career. No, no development, nothing. Uh, then the kind of other one that um, is equally problematic is uh, you finish school with a set of skills, um, suddenly you get made redundant, you need a new set of skills, you get your education for that, you, you check them in and then you, once you get reskilled and re-employed, no more education, and then you retire, no more education. So all of those models of learning are out the door and although we probably all know people who subscribe to them, I think they'd be very um, they'd be very, they find it very difficult to make those arguments now. What we've had to do in general as a society is adapt very fast to very different situations. Um, people are good at adapting. Adaptation is the learning process and that's what we need to be mindful of. Now, the next line, I deliberately, I'm sorry about this for all of you. I put in two words which sound and, and look very close together. And the reason why I kind of put them is it, e it's easy to, um, you know, to kind of mistake one for the other. Um, and I, it was in trying to kind of, you know, when I was first introduced to both of those, I kind of thought that's a lovely idea. And I have found it uh, personally to be um, uh, a value that I use in my education. So I'll try and explain it. Critical consciousness is an awareness of the power relationships in the world. The person who put that forward would be Paolo Ferreri um, and had said, look, when we work with our uh, students, they, we develop their critical awareness. Um, and you know where he said, you know, reading the world, uh, you know, and, and uh, reading the word, but reading the world as well. So when we become angry at the inequalities and the justice, uh, the injustices in a system, maybe the lack of provision in a certain area and things like that. That's our critical consciousness. And as educators, because we're close to the front line of alienation, of people coming in from that alienated part of society and trying to bring them in, our critical consciousness is usually very, very well developed. There's a lot of angry educators out there. And if you want to know what's wrong with society, ask an educator, they will tell you. But we also have to have conscientiousness. I mean, we've just had a, 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 a really good session on QQI on validating programs and on, on, the, on the work that we need to do to, um, uh, to, to name and to, um, <clears throat> to what we call record the achievements of our learners. We owe it to our learners to be meticulous and to be conscientious in our work and to, and to use structures and processes so the work can be acclaimed. So what I've loved in that sentence, as I say myself, I always say critical consciousness and conscientiousness, you know, I see them as like a tension between the two often. I want to change things, but I also need to be conscientious about doing things the right way. And that's just been useful for me. So I think in this context, that's something that uh, we, we would, and, you know, uh, I would say um, big thumbs up to QQI as well in getting that balance in this context, right, about conscientiousness, but also having a, a critical consciousness around the challenges that people face. And finally, um, my, point, my point is that the, the gift you give to your learners um, and to your setting, uh, that the gift that will continue to give is your own well-being. And sometimes we lose sight of that because a lot of people in education are naturally inclined to look to the needs of their students. But it's important to give uh, time and resource to your own needs and your own well-being. So keep that gift because others will need it as you go into the future.